Dancy, uh, namely its People's Liberation Army Navy in the Atlantic. Uh, okay, I need to, to change the slide. Ah, it's here, it's here, okay. So, um, here, uh, we often see that um, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans are the most um, at least talked and explored uh, oceans in what regards China's maritime incursions. Um, we have a lot of academic uh, um, investigation regarding, for instance, the so-called uh, string of pearls in the Indian Ocean, um, the Taiwan issue, and the uh, maritime uh, um, controversial uh, disputes with other neighbors. But uh, when it comes specifically to more remote um, oceans, such as the South Atlantic uh, or the Atlantic, um, which is divided now in North and, and, and South, um, at least for the purpose of research, we see that the debate is uh, is uh, is scant, and we even see that there there is um, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an increasing uh, research about China's polar Silk Road. So um, there is a void uh, in the Atlantic, which seems to be an opportunity because. NATO are mainly concerned with the high north, what in what Russia does or does not, and China's polar uh, uh, Silk Road. And when we go um, um, down in the vast Atlantic, we see that the, there is a geostrategic uh, vacuum, and this vacuum is being um, is being. Uh, um, the object of an increasing attention by China. So, uh, but when we talk about the South Atlantic, first the Atlantic as a whole, uh, in in the, in the perspective of uh, an American called Walter Lippmann, it should be uh, an indivisible community. Uh, the Atlantic has a wall, as he as he envisioned it. But we see that the Atlantic is far from being a, an harmonious. Uh, well, it is actually a fragmented space with many imbalances. And uh, NATO is quite absent from the South Atlantic. We see, nevertheless, that the Atlantic is kind of regaining uh, um, momentum uh, despite, despite our attention is mainly in uh, the Asia Pacific, or or in the different concept, the Indo Pacific, I I, I actually don't like uh, as well to 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 divide this uh, this parts of the ocean, but whatever, it's the literature that does it. So uh, we see that the Atlantic may be um, on the verge of regaining uh, momentum. And why why do we see uh, this? this revival of the attention of the South Atlantic. A reason is, first of all, connected to its biodiversity, mineral and energy resources, and a planet where uh, resources are increasingly scarce. But before we explore helium tree from the moon, um, we still have to go a long way. The technology, is not enough developed to bring that uh, part of resources from the outer space. So we need to further explore the other forbidden borders, which are precisely the bottom of the oceans. And the Atlantic could be the, I would say, the last ocean, but it's still an ocean and still important for China. Um, despite it's not its immediate periphery, but it's full of resources, and we know it, there is still too much to discover in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean compared to what we already know regarding the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. So, um, and there is a void. Na NATO is not there, it's more in the North Atlantic, and uh, we see 
China's uh, fishing activities, they are increasing. Uh, it, it is understandable. China had uh, the most populous country uh, in the world. Now, India, for the first time, overcome. But Indian are also uh, in the, the Atlantic Ocean. And you see a space of competition. Now, um, well, China's interests in the South Atlantic are not new. But the thing is, the assertiveness and um, the, uh, the, 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 the ability to distantiate itself from the principle of non-interference, the ability to understand the, the importance of protecting its own diaspora is something that is changing at a quite fast pace. Uh, imagine what is to um, come um, to rescue your diaspora when you have your People Liberation Army Navy on, on Djibouti. It will take approximately two weeks to come into the Atlantic Ocean. So China understood the need of being in the near medium term future, a resident Atlantic power. A, and in, in, in this regard, the Djibouti, which is smaller than the city of Chicago in the United States, is something new. Well, it's not that new because other powers have their own military there. For China, it's kind of new. Mm -hmm. So what we argue is that we could see an extension of the string of pearls that already exists in the Indian Ocean gradually to the Atlantic Ocean. It will not be immediately, but it's the next gradual step. Um, so we, sh we see China looking uh, to develop its blue um, water navy. What does that mean? China has a green and brown water navy. China can protect its immediate waters and rivers, but it's building its second and third, second is already built, a third, fourth aircraft carriers to be able to project its power in the oceans. Okay. To do this, China needs to overcome the second island of chain. Uh, that is in the Pacific, but also to go into more remote areas such as the Atlantic. Why is the Atlantic important, not just for resources, but because it will divert US attention and mains that are making pressure on China's coastal areas and relocate these means to other uh, places such as the Atlantic. There was, uh, I don't remember his name, but the a Chinese admiral of a Chinese aircraft career, uh, career saying, I will serve better my country's interests if my aircraft career is, far, uh, is in more distant areas and not just confined to China's periphery. That will oblige indirectly US and its allies to therefore dislocate its means and alleviating pressure on the Indian Pacific. So for all these reasons, resources, energy, um, protecting the diaspora, the first anti-terrorist law, uh, Chinese anti-terrorist law that allows for the, uh, the plan to um, operate abroad to protect the lives of its citizen is already an unprecedented uh, pace step. It, it comes from 2015, Djibouti, 2017. Uh, and we see, well, uh, a longstanding uh, option for the Beijing consensus, China as the more important trading partner, not just for Africa, but for most of the nations and countries all around the world. And uh, you see that uh, matter of inter interdependence. Mm -hmm. So um, this has uh, important impacts for the US, build back better future, and for the Europe that understood, now we have someone from France, Macron, understood the failure of its, uh, of its uh, African policy, 
but it was too late. It was too late. Uh, in the meantime, Russian and Chinese had already made uh, important attempts to conquer uh, and to get the most of these resources. So uh, we are seeing an important competition in Africa, but also in the other part of uh, the Atlantic, which is precisely US uh, near abroad due to the Monroe Doctrine that goes until the, until the end of uh, Latin America. The Gulf of Guinea is a very important place, region, due to the resources. We see there are many difficulties concerning, for instance, Boko Haram, piracy. You, you see that Angola is uh, also uh, an important oil exporter for China, uh, but you need to be there to protect your diaspora and the maritime lanes of communication. Three minutes, okay. And uh, China learned a lot when Gaddafi, uh, Libya, uh, well, uh, no, knew its collapse. China also knew a lot in Sudan. So it's better to expand its involvement and not to concentrate all your stakes in just one country. This is a great lesson for China. And therefore, uh, you need as well, like Man says, in the, the, na the merchant fleet needs to have uh, um, a navy uh, uh, to protect it and also um, points uh, to refuel all along the ocean. So uh, this is important. We see possible candidates for having uh, um, a, a naval base of China in the South Atlantic. One of them is Equatorial Guinea and Namibia. Namibia is another important candidate. So I will end uh, uh, here. Um, we see, I'm going to the conclusions, we see that since 2014, People's Liberation Army Navy has been more and more interested in the South Atlantic. It has started with port calls, friendly um, uh, visits, and then um, also associated to the need to fill in this governance vacuum. You have Brazil as the hegemon, but Brazil is not NATO. Brazil doesn't have the necessary means to protect the Atlantic. So this space is a vacuum, and China is trying to fill in. And at the same time, we see geoeconomics evolve to geopolitics. We no longer, we, we see China's important trade, but at the same time, China is protecting this trade by investing, uh, increasingly investing in its, uh, in its uh, Navy. It, this is the fastest modernization of the Navy in modern history. No country has invested so massively and so rapid uh, than China. So the US will have problems. Uh, the US general said the next war, it's not with Russia, it will probably be with China because China is doing it so quickly, so fast, but decreasing the gap, the technological gap that separates it from uh, the US uh, army. This doesn't mean that in the next decade, the US, the West, will last as the superpower. But in the 20, 30 years to come, the US will have uh, certainly more problems to deal with the People's Liberation Army Navy. And the South Atlantic is one of these remote spaces that will test as well uh, US ability uh, at a time when Africa is choosing different partners. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jean-Louis Liu, who is PhD candidate at Yunnan University and Leiden University, and who will talk about uh, proposing a comparative analysis of China in US uh, in the ASEAN and Asia Pacific context. The floor is yours for 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Jin Rui Liu. I'm a PhD candidate 
of Yunnan University and a visiting PhD scholar at Leiden University. My topic is a comparative study of China and the US responses to ASEAN security in the context of the Indo-Pacific. So first I want to introduce my research question and my research methods. Yes, uh, recently the Indo-Pacific has become a hot topic around the world. Many countries and regional organizations has published its Indo-Pacific version or strategy. And yes, both China and the US are ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is organization's most important dialogue partners. And all of them are publicly support ASEAN's charity in the Indo-Pacific. So, but I found their diverge in their policy in and actions. So I want to explore which factors lead to this condition. And my method is document analysis and compare heavy research. I read a lot of public and official document documents and do comparative research based on my analytic framework. So firstly, I want to introduce the ASEAN's charity in the context of Indo-Pacific. ASEAN centrality is the center concept I want to do research. According to the ASEAN Charter, there are two meanings of ASEAN centrality. Firstly, ASEAN should be the internal central platform for its member states. Here are their member states to address their common challenge. Secondly, ASEAN should be the regional central platform for its member states to multilaterally engage with other important powers, such as China, US, EU, Russia. And based on the ASEAN, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, AOIP, which was published in 2019, ASEAN innovates the ASEAN charity concept. ASEAN want not only being the central platform in Southeast Asia, but they want to be the central platform for the whole Indo-Pacific, as you can see from the map, from here to here. So yes, and and there are second innovation is ASEAN countries should increase their maritime cooperation, connectivity, and try to achieve the like UN SDG 2030 and uh, achieve cooperation in economic and other possible areas with other external powers. So this is ASEAN security in the context of Indo-Pacific, which is ASEAN security based on the AOIP. So I'm interested in both China and the US response. So I firstly introduce China's response. As the China's official statement about its support to ASEAN centrality in the involving regional architecture, this is an official report. As China ties ASEAN centrality in the current time to the acceptance of the AOIP. Uh, maybe, you maybe know China is reluctant to accept the idea of Indo-Pacific, but China in this time, in this condition, choose to accept the version of Indo-Pacific of ASEAN. This is very interesting. Also, China views AOIP as an independent initiative of ASEAN, not like US Indo-Pacific strategy, which want to counter China. And uh, in the 30s, special anniversary summit between China and ASEAN leaders. Chinese President Xi Jinping said, China is very interesting, high quality belt road cooperation with AOIP. China wished to achieve standard cooperation between BRI and master plan of 
ASEAN Sustainability leads to different initiatives on infrastructure development in the region. Also, the U.S. also shows its support to AOIP and ASEAN security in its document. For example, in the 2022, the Biden administration published its first Indo-Pacific strategy document. It said it ASEAN it ha, holds, should hold independency and leadership in Southeast Asia and ASEAN and ASEAN security is important for the U.S. to achieve the cooperation between its Indo-Pacific strategy with AOIP. And according to the September 9th statement between the U.S. and ASEAN, it said maritime cooperation is their primary cooperation area. So. U.S. chose to increase maritime cooperation, like uh, cutting the illegal fishing and mar increasing maritime domain awareness and extra many areas maritime cooperation. So from the first size, I can give a, just a, a compare, comparison which means China prefers to achieve high quality connectivity, which means China want to achieve a policy facilities, trade, finance, and people to people bonds with ASEAN countries. So China prefers to achieve the second priority area of ASEAN in AOIP, the connectivity. But the US prefer to Cooperate on the maritime security issues, such as IUU illegal fishing, MDA, and USACP. USACP means the cities partnership between US and ASEAN countries. So why they are different? I want to use the ground strategy theory to analyze this difference. Uh, based on this theory, uh, universities and uh, countries' strategy are based on three factors, strategic goals, strategic environment, and strategic capacity. And I found these three factors are inter if, if influence, which means a good strategy should be based on the balance between these three factors. So I want to compare based on these three factors. Firstly, based on a strategic environment. From the conceptual level, the strategic environment means the geopolitical and geoeconomic environment of a country. For China, China is located near, very near in the Southeast Asia and China views Southeast Asia and ASEAN as China's neighbor. It should be included in China's naval diplomacy, which based on the mutual interest. And China found it's very hard to increase real maritime security because like South China Sea issue, some ASEAN countries are not just China. So China prefers to increase the cooperation on connectivity, which means infrastructure development, which is a common demanding area between China and ASEAN countries. And the US, US is very far away in geography from ASEAN, but ASEAN and Southeast Asia hold many crucial water, waterways, such as Malacca Strait, which is very important for U US, Ally, Japan, and South Korea. And it's also very important for the US trade around the world. Yeah, so this is one reason why they prefer different policy. And for the second reason, the strategic goals, based on theory, 
strategic goals include the targets of a foreign policy strategy, which are defined by the national interests. And China's strategic goals of BRI and is to achieve a community with a short future with ASEAN. And also it's China's national reservation. So it's both realist and institutionalist view of the world order. And for the US, it want to ensure the American leadership in the Indo-Pacific region from the Indo-Pacific strategy of the US. US viewed itself as an Indo-Pacific country, not just an Asia-Pacific country. And for the main aim of US strategy is to shape the strategic environment of China. And for maritime, it's, US find it is easier to shape because it has a big platform like the navigation of freedom. US always submit, deployed its Navy to the Southeast Asia and the South China Sea. So I think this is the second reason why China prefers to increase the connectivity and the US prefers to increase maritime, strat maritime strategy. Thank you. And nearly end. For the strategic capacity, as I know, my colleague will give a more detailed explanation later about this kind of idea. So I just uh, give a, a quick one. How means how does a country allocate its available strategic resources, which include both hard and soft, which means influence and like uh, hard power. And China has more strategic capacity in infrastructure investment and economic influence on Southeast Asia. And the US have a more deeper maritime security cooperation and value connections. At the US has a very long history in with some ASEAN countries such as Thailand and the Philippines, they are alliance for a long time. So they have deeper connections. And the Philippines is very demanding on maritime security cooperation with the US because Philippines is worried about China in South China Sea. So yes, so China has more capacity in allocating resources in the connectivity, but the US has more capacity in its Navy and value connections with South East Asian countries. So this is the third reason. And in conclusion, yes, China prefers to achieve high quality connectivity and the US prefers to achieve more, more maritime cooperation. It depends on their different strategic environment, strategic goals and the strategic capacity, which calls up their policy preference. And so this is my conclusion of why they are different in their policy. And yeah, almost the end. And thanks for your attention and listening. Thank you very much for the concise and detailed precision at the same time. Our last and next speaker is Chao Ting Cheng to talk to us about um, BRI and Indo-Pacific. The floor is yours for also 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cao Ting Chen. I'm from the Free University of Berlin in Germany. And uh, before uh, deciding to pursue a, uh, an academia career, I worked uh, at uh, Huawei Technologies uh, 15 years uh, in China, India, West Africa, and uh, Germany. So uh, my presentation is about uh, foreign strategic capabilities. Actually, this is a uh, a concept invented by Chinese scholars. For Western scholars, I have never seen such literature. So uh, uh, my study will be a comparative analysis of China's Bird and Zod Initiative and the Indo-Pacific strategy of the US. And uh, the, sorry. Uh,
I'd like to introduce the research background question and uh, uh, approach. The background, uh, first, uh, there are two very different uh, perspectives regarding the foreign strategic capabilities of China and the US. One viewpoint holds that China has a natural advantage due to its centralized and stable political system, which enables China to mobilize all of its resources in support of its long-term strategies. Whereas the US has a significant disadvantage due to US federal government has very limited power and very frequent turnover. And, but there is another alternative perspective operates that the US foreign strategies, which are the outcome of the competition of different ideas and interest groups and reflect the national consensus of the US. Therefore, it's more enduring and consistent than those of China. So my question of research is that what the reality is and Amidst the ongoing Sino American strategic competition, which superpower uh, has more formidable foreign strategic capabilities? My approach is to address this question uh, through one uh, general analytical framework of, friend, of foreign strategic capabilities uh, based on the series of strategy and uh, grand strategy. So, this framework will be uh, applied for a comparative case study uh, between China's BRI and the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. And uh, this is a general framework. It looks very complicated, but actually it includes three essential elements of any strategy. First, ends. Second, means. And the third, ways. And uh, uh, I will focus on ends and ways. So let me just uh, briefly introduce the means uh, for the means of the strategy. Uh, it includes three uh, categories. First, geopolitics, second, uh, geoeconomics, and the third, uh, soft power. Uh, uh, poli politics, military, security, intelligence. Uh, they are mainly traditional geopolitical means, but for the geoeconomic means, uh, which includes the finance technologies and especially infrastructure in case uh, of BRI. And um, of course, we have some soft power like institution, norm, value, and culture and uh, ideology because uh, means uh, are mainly objective factors. So this is not my focus. I will, uh, I will be focused on uh, ends and ways. So for the ends of any strategy, you have to consider rationality, uh, balance, uh, prioritization, and uh, purposefulness. And uh, for the ways, this is really important. This is a soft part of any strategy. Uh, this is decisive in translating your means into your objectives. So uh, there are many different uh, dimensions of ways but I would like to focus on the so-called 4C model. It means uh, coherence, uh, consistency, coordination, and uh, cost efficiency. So now let, let's focus on the case study of BRI and the Indo-Pacific strategy. So the NAFTA is a BRI. It uh, includes uh, land part and maritime part. And uh, the right side is the Indo-Pacific Pacific strategy. Uh, it's the geographical coverage of this strategy is uh, very huge, actually. Different countries have different Indo-Pacific strategies. For the US, uh, its uh, Indo-Pacific strategy covers the so-called from uh, Hollywood to Bollywood. That means from, uh, uh, from East Pacific to uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, this is so-called from Hollywood to Bollywood. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, the coherence uh, of uh, uh, two strategies. Uh, 
just now my colleague has mentioned about uh, geoeconomics and uh, geopolitics. I think uh, the main uh, criteria of uh, differentiating item geopolitics from geoeconomics uh, is the means. For example, if you are bombing one uh, cultural facility, uh, this is absolutely, or you are bombing one factory, this is absolutely not geoeconomics, but uh, geopolitics. So for the geopolitics, uh, uh, the main means uh, is uh, normally hard power, like uh, military, security, and uh, intelligence. But for the geoeconomics, uh, uh, they still have political objective, but the means are different. For example, trade policy, investment policy, financial policy, cyber and monetary policy, and so on, especially infrastructure in, in the case of BRI. So uh, my finding about uh, the coherence of BRI, the primary end of BRI is um, the global community of shared future. And uh, they have uh, economic, culture, and uh, diplomatic means. And the ways are the so-called five links. And um, according to my uh, research, the BRI is mainly a geopolitical geoeconomic strategy because uh, it mainly use economic means to achieve China's uh, political objectives. But on the other hand, uh, uh, GRI is not completely without uh, geopolitical consideration and uh, measures. For example, China has uh, established its first overseas military base in Djibouti and uh, for the CPAC uh, and uh, the projects in Myanmar, there are uh, obviously geopolitical consideration. But uh, I would like to emphasize uh, uh, that geopolitical means have always played a secondary role in the implementation of the BRI. That's why uh, I believe BRI is mainly a geoeconomic strategy. Uh, BRI can be considered as a coherent and organic strategy. So now let's talk about the coherence of the IPS. Uh, originally, IPS was a geopolitical strategy because uh, the U.S. federal government has uh, limited power. They cannot order the U.S. business uh, to uh, save its foreign strategy. They can encourage U.S. private sector uh, in the pursuit of foreign strategy, but they cannot force them to do that. And the second reason, the U.S. has a very strong military and cooperation with uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, that's why they mainly uh, rely on the traditional diplomatic intelligence and military means. So that's why uh, originally Indo-Pacific strategy was a typical geopolitical strategy, security oriented. But uh, the US has realized uh, they have shortcomings in the implementation of Indo-Pacific strategy, especially uh, facing the competition from, from China's side. Uh, especially BRI. So now U.S. has made a uh, tremendous efforts to enhance its economic dimension of Indo-Pacific strategy. For example, AUKUS has uh, economic and technological dimension. Uh, Quad has also tech network. And the U.S. has also announced the Indo-Pacific economic framework. And uh, uh, G7 has announced a partnership for global infrastructure and investment. And recently, they have announced uh, India, Middle East, uh, and the European Economic uh, Corridor. That's why the coherence of in, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy is also quite high. So now let's talk about uh, the consistency of BRI. This figure is made from uh, made based on the data from Boston University. So as you can see, the peak time of BRC, I mean the Chinese Overseas Development Finance is 2016. And after 2016, it's uh, decreasing very sharply. And uh, I have another uh, figure uh, based on the data from American Enterprise Institute. It's a little, uh, it's slightly different. This data is about China's global investments and uh, construction. So the peak time is 2017. And since then, uh, uh, China's uh, investment uh, abroad has 
uh, declined uh, too. So that means uh, BRI really has uh, a problem or challenge for consistency, but it does not mean BRI is dead. Now, many uh, Western scholars and the medians uh, are claiming uh, BRI is dead. No, BRI is not dead. BRI is uh, upgrading from uh, BRI 1.0 to 2.0. This has demonstrated the flexibility of Chinese government. So, but this is not my focus about the f uh, flexibility. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, the consistency of Indo-Pacific strategy. Actually, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy is uh, an old idea. So uh, in 2011, the, okay, the American Secretary of uh, State, Hillary, has the idea of American Pacific century. And the uh, Trump administration, Biden administration, have, both have published its uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. So this is the evolution. Okay, now let's talk about the domestic coordination. My conclusion is that uh, the overall degree of uh, coordination, uh, domestic co uh, co coordination of BRI is quite high, but uh, it's not as high as people imagined because uh, uh, the stakeholders uh, have their own self-interpretation uh, uh, about uh, the implementation of BRI. So the international coordination, uh, so uh, because the time is limited, uh, I will not go through uh, everything. Uh, the problem is for BRI is that it's still very Sino-centric and uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy is quite uh, multilateral. So last uh, dimension, cost effectiveness. I think the main challenge for BRI is that uh, uh, China does not care about too much about the cost, uh, uh, the economic cost. They focus on they focus more on the political benefits, but the U.S. cannot because uh, for the private sector they must consider the cost. So this is the main difference. Okay, this is summary uh, of the difference of foreign strategic capabilities between BRI and the Indo-Pacific strategy. So my conclusion, uh, BRI and uh, IPS are comparable in terms of coherence because they both employ geopolitical and geoeconomic means. Uh, but uh, second, for the domestic coordination, China outperforms uh, uh, the United States because Chinese government is more powerful in mobilizing its resource. And the third, uh, uh, the IPS has shown some comparative advantage in the dimension of consistency as we have uh, seen. And finally, in terms of cost efficiency, uh, it seems that uh, IPS has some advantage. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. We are going to open the floor for a uh, discussion by collecting a first round of uh, questions. And uh, for each panelist, I would, I would ask you to keep your answers as short as possible within one and two minutes so we can have multiple questions. So I see, Heinz, you have a, a first question. Thank you for all these very uh, informed and detailed uh, uh, presentations. Um, all of uh, your presentations cover both. On the one hand, you have connectivity and trade, uh, also in the case of MIS, Maritime uh, Silk Road, uh, but also uh, ge geopolitics. But on the other hand, you have uh, naval security, naval capacity, the military dimension, geopolitics. So somehow in each of the presentations, it's um, used interchangeable. So I want to have some clarification. If you look at uh, IR 
theories. You have the interdependence school, which says connectivity is supposed to create peaceful uh, solutions and peaceful uh, uh, resolutions. If you, on the other hand, look more on the military dimension, the naval dimension, uh, you have more the power projection dimension. So the question is, what is prevalent? What is prevalent? So is the military dimension prevalent when, you, when it comes to the BIA or the, or the MSR? Or is it about trade and uh, connectivity and interdependence? So empirically, I guess you could even uh, look at, for example, at the ports. If you look at ports in the, in the, in the case of MSR, uh, are they used for peaceful and trade purposes or are they used for military purposes? So that would be uh, possible to look, it's one possible to look at it empirically, but my main question is, so you have both, you have here connectivity and you have power projection. So is it more unilateralism or it's more multilateralism? So if you have multilateralism, of course, connectivity, interdependence uh, prevails. If you have unilateralism, power projection prevails. So what is, what, where is, if you weigh it, of course, everybody of you would say both. Yeah, you would say both, but somehow you have to, to, to weigh it. What is, what is, what comes first? What is the priority of all these actions you describe? Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. I would say uh, money comes first. Uh, the realist approach, for me, in my opinion, even the Marshall Plan was about realism. Uh, the United States could not help a devastated uh, Europe without they they first knew, knew that it, it would be in the benefit of the US. So you need markets to expand your goods. I agree with my colleague when he said that um, contrary to uh, US approach in the Indian Pacific, the Belt and Road is uh, mainly geoeconomic, yes. But to a certain extent, it evolved to a military approach indirectly. You have a port diplomacy, which works with soft power with hard cash. You have to convince states of the importance of having um, not just necessary frigates, but China Ocean Shipping Company, which is for dual purpose. No one suspects of Maersk, but the Chinese way, it, it is for intelligence purposes and for civil as well. Uh, you know, we no longer hear about the Nicaragua Canal. It was allegedly a project by a Chinese billionaire, as we heard also about uh, the 300 square kilometers by Wang Nubo, a Chinese billionaire that tried to purchase a part of Iceland. They are all billionaires, but we know that it's the party itself that wants to have a strategic foothold in key places of the world. Of course, in Malacca, you don't need the Chinese frigate to control this uh, straits because the, the level of interdependence, and here comes liberalism, is so great, so huge that these countries very difficultly will say no to China. China no longer needs to build the Nicaragua Canal because Panama no longer recognizes Taiwan. So the level of interdependence is so great that uh, economics, in this case, overcomes uh, geopolitics. Hmm? Djibouti, China started to invest so much, so much, so much, and then came the military. Uh, so I would say... Uh, at the end of the day, it's all military and it's all uh, realism. Because, and therefore I, I explained, um, and to finish, I explained that in the case of China, uh, in the case of China, uh, we see that it's geoeconomics, but gradually with the military being more assertive. Hmm? Xi Jinping no longer fears 
And we saw that in August about the uh, Taiwan crisis. Uh, this China is bolder. Nowadays, China is no longer shy compared to the China of the 90s. When the US sent one or two aircraft carriers, China, to a certain degree, respected. But this China, Xi Jinping, has been giving orders to say, you have to be ready to prepare uh, to, for a war in space, in war and land. So this is a bolder China. Realism prevails in nowadays China. Otherwise, you wouldn't understand Putin, uh, Tehran, Pyongyang, and Islamabad, uh, uh, Axis, and the very rest of the world. Because the Western world is pushing these powers, and they act as a force towards the rest. So I would say realism, to be honest. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like to answer your question from my perspective. I think you are raising one important uh, theoretical question. This is about the difference between politics and the economy. Politics is about power. Power is limited. So the political game is normally a zero-sum game. Power is limited. The, if the US power is declined, then Chinese power increase. So this is uh, this is a uh, characteristics of uh, politics. But for economy, the logic can be very different because uh, wealth is unlimited. So that's why economic relationship can be win-win or multi multiple win. This is possible. So it depends on your interpretation. Uh, for BRI, if you interpret the BRI as one geopolitical strategy, because this is about power, that's why it's typical zero sum game. But if you interpret BRI as economic cooperation, for example, for many global South countries, uh, they believe BRI is totally about economic cooperation. So this is win win. This is true. So, I mean, this is really depends on your interpretation. Just want to add one point uh, from my perspective. Yes, based on the securitization theory, which means uh, economic issue can also become a security issue. Like what the US was doing to China, like the strategic decouple. China won't, uh, don't want the US to decouple with its economy. And, but US think China is a threat on its security, especially on its security on global leadership. And the U.S. wish to uh, transfer its supply chain in China to the Southeast Asia. So it's kind of both the security and the economic issue. So yeah, it's hard to see. Yeah, which is maybe for the U.S. the security is always the first, but for China maybe security and the economy maybe it's not it's very not very clear. There's no very clear uh, distinction. Yeah, I just want to add something. Um, for instance, you see China that has been always a, a partisan of bilateralism. It, it didn't lose bilateralism, but at the same time, China uses geoeconomics to escape the world's um, containment by the by the U.S. That's why China is built its uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So. China is creating a parallel order with, curiously, uh, many European and other Western states are present. So they want to be between East and West. China in the multilateralism, you have a multilateralism a la carte, where the 16 plus one works, now 14 plus one works in the Eastern and Central part of Europe. But it doesn't explain China's friends relationships or Portugal, which is bilateralism or Greece. So you have a multilateralism and a multilateralism a la carte. This is part of geoeconomics, but also, also mixed with soft power. At the same time, you have a deep a military uh, in South China Sea, in um, Senkaku Islands, the uh, air identification zone, uh, in other parts of the world. So it's a mixed approach, but in my view, realism always um, prevails. Thank you very much. Do we have a second question? 
one time, two times. If not, I will use my the privilege of a chair to ask uh, questions. And after that, we can move to the to the next panel, unless there is a, a, another question. Um, to to you, Paolo, I have a question about uh, with the South Atlantic. And how do you see the fact that Argentina joining the BRICS could change or increase or alterate the, the situation you, you described? And then to our, I think it's questions that could be, uh, and the second question is intended to uh, both of you, um, and is more on the idea of, on the field of perceptions and interpretation. Who, how do you think um, BRI and uh, is perceived in its new format compared to uh, Indo-Pacific and, and uh, US project? How do you think it is perceived by countries receiving uh, investments and or uh, influence either from the US and, and China? And have you, during your study and data collection processes, have you found anything related to uh, discourses and more like how China is developing a narrative to uh, promote and legitimate its action or to uh, avoid any uh, strong or decrease any strong uh, US uh, reactions? Okay, uh, to be short, um, Argentina alone doesn't make any difference. But many Argentinians together, that's what is happening. Um, uh, they make the difference, especially because they feel this world order is obsolete. And they find in China, look at the G77, they find in China um, and US, but differently from the US, and based on the Beijing consensus. Um, and Brazil, the neighbor of Argentina, is even or as more important than Argentina. So I would say Argentina alone doesn't make any difference, but several states become uh, on the verge of joining uh, more um, Chinese-led projects. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a good case of China in the multilateralism. We have several new uh, successful cases. See uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, it's not just because of the merit of China, but the failure of U.S. in diplomacy. U.S. failed in Afghanistan, in Vietnam, and they failed to understand that the world does not work like the U.S. would like it to work. So China uh, probably will need many other Argentinas to, uh, in the long term, replace this, uh, this current world order. Yeah, uh, I want to answer question how about how China used this cause to legitimate to legitimate its actions, like uh, China always used the community of shared future of human being, which is very comprehensive concept, and uh, yes, both and I found both China and the U.S. are very careful about the environmental issue, especially at this year's APEC leadership summit, their statement between US and China's leaders. And they both said they want to increase cooperation in the achieving the UN SDG 2030, which means have more cooperation between the US and China in the environmental issue. It's a global issue. So this kind of, and also for the people to people bonds, means more connectivity between people to people. Yes, China want to uh, increase its open and like uh, give a visa free policy to many European country and Asian countries. This kind of actions which will not increase the negative reaction of the US. So China currently is seeking cooperation with the US. I wish this cooperation trade will continue. Maybe in the security and connectivity, I mean the infrastructure development area, China and US have many conflicts, but I also found there are any there are many cooperation opportunities between these two countries. 
and between China and many uh, Asian country and the European countries. So thank you, Matthew, for your question. Uh, I do have some research data uh, for your question uh, in terms of the perception of uh, BRI countries toward the uh, Chinese BRI. The first uh, data is from one research institute in Singapore. It's about uh, the perception of local public and the needs toward uh, China and the USA. And uh, the findings is very interesting. Uh, more than 60% uh, of people, both uh, uh, general public and the elites, believe China, not the USA, is the most influential economic power. Uh, this is uh, the feedback from Southeast Asian countries. Um, and the second is uh, from African, African continent. Uh, my professor has uh, conducted one research in four African countries, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, South Africa, South Africa and uh, East Obia, uh, the East, South, uh, East, West, South and North of Africa. And uh, the opinion of uh, African people uh, is more positive toward China than uh, the US because they believe Chinese approach has shown more respect, more respect uh, toward the uh, African people and China uh, has shown more willingness to understand local requirements. So this is the uh, con concrete uh, research data. And uh, my uh, interpretation is quite clear because uh, uh, China cares more about political influence than economic cost. So actually China has spent uh, more than one trillion US dollar in BRI. Many projects uh, actually have the problem of cost. So I think this is a challenge facing China. If China wants to make a BRI more sustainable, they must uh, have more consideration on economic cost. Thank you. Is there any last opportunity for any short question? If not, I will ask you to join me in thanking our panelists and we can move to the next panel.